Good job, band. Hallelujah. Hey, we are. How you feeling today? How you feeling? You like being around God? I like being around God. Amen. I mean, I got dressed. I went to church. Looking good, right, Corey? We're looking, we're looking good. God shows up. Makes it worth it. Amen. You know, when he shows up, everything can change, right? Like everything can change in a moment of an encounter with Jesus. I firmly believe that. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. You know, his spirit is here and he's ministering and uh, he's continuing to minister right now uh, because he can't stop, right? It's just kind of what he does. And uh, we don't want to um, have like the anointing present in the worship, uh, you know, and the anointing present in the giving. And then we like turn off our spirit, man, and just get all mental in the message. Now, I don't want you to, you know, check out of your brain. I want you to use your brain uh, because I used my brain to write the message, right? Uh, and I like, you know, at least think a little bit. Uh, but we, we want to stay engaged with the Spirit of God through the message. Amen? Are you with me? Amen. Are we on the same page? Yeah. Are you feeling good? Yeah. I mean, I'm happy. I just got joyful in the worship there, didn't you? Yeah. Righteous peace and in the Holy Ghost, right? Amen. I like joy. Some Christians don't like joy as much, I found out. I did, it was bizarre. I didn't, know that, I didn't know that people wouldn't like joy. I didn't know that. Isaac, I didn't know it. I didn't know that some Christians would hold on to bitterness so strongly and like be so upset when Christians are getting joyful. It's just the weirdest thing in the world. It's almost like they earned their, their misery. You're not taking it from me. I worked hard for this. I refuse to give it up. What will I complain about if I give this up? If I'm all joyful. What will I, what will I complain about if I'm all joyful? Amen. So, hey, we're in our, <clears throat> excuse me, Stephen message series, working our way through the book of Acts. Uh, we're in the part where we're learning about Stephen, who's a servant, a prophet, and a martyr. And before I get in the message series, I want to talk just a little bit uh, about the graphic, as odd as that sounds. Uh, the way it works for me is when I write a message series, uh, I, know, I know the series I'm going into. And often, um, I kind of, I get the direction by working on the series graphic. And that's just how it works for me. Because uh, I visually... I want a visual representation of what I feel God is doing. And so he kind of works with me in the artistic process, and I'll come up with a, with a, with a graphic that looks good, but I'm like, nah, that doesn't really represent what God is going to do in this. And so it's a, it's a process that I work through, and any artists out there probably understand what I'm talking about. And, uh, and in this one, I knew when I made this graphic, it was going to make some people a little uneasy. A little uneasy. Let me tell you why. Uh, because Stephen here, to some people, they look at that and they say he looks Catholic, right? Now, Stephen was here before the Catholic Church. I don't know if you know that. Amen. Peter didn't actually establish the Catholic Church, no matter what some people may have taught you. It's not actually true. And the Apostles' Creed talks about the Holy Catholic Church, meaning the one unified church. And as we look through church history, if you put up my first graphic here, we see that in, throughout church history, there's been three major arms of the Christian church. There's the Orthodox Church, say Orthodox. There's the Catholic Church, say Catholic. And there's the Protestant Church, say Protestant. Okay, these are three different arms of the Catholic of the uh, Christian movement. Are you with me? Okay, and so what we found out was <clears throat> uh, the Protestants uh, come out of the Catholics, right? So we know that the Catholics uh, were kind of uh, running things there for a while. And because they had power and because they had authority, uh, unfortunately, power goes to some people's heads and they don't use it well, right? And so sometimes people use their power for their own benefit more than the benefit of maybe everybody that God wants to bless, right? And so around 1500, uh, uh, in the 1500s, a dude named Martin Luther said, eh, I think that we've kind of gone astray and we're leaving the Catholic Church, right? And so what happened in the Catholic Church was, you know, they began uh, worshiping some stuff other than God and sort of praying to people other than God and started using money and manipulation in ways that God wasn't excited about. And so Luther said, you know, we're taking our toys and we're leaving, right? We're, we're, we're out of here. And they started the Protestant church, right? And so the Protestant church, which is most of the churches in America, come out of the Catholic church. And now there was a problem when that happened. And I've talked about this before, but there was a problem when that happened because uh, the Protestant church had to kind of compromise a little bit when they left. The Catholics said, we are the one holy true church because we have miracles. That is proof that we're the right church. And so the Protestants, instead of going after miracles, said, well, 
that we declare that miracles no longer are for today. That's where cessationism comes from. Cessationism comes out of the Reformation that says that we don't need the Catholic Church to be Christians and we're going to throw everything away that we think is Catholic, including miracles and healings and the supernatural. And so it became all cerebral, right? And so many people, uh, maybe you're from a Catholic area where there was a strong Protestant move and, and you see things that look Catholic and you get a little uneasy because you don't want to be Catholic. And people have even accused me of, you know, letting demons in the church and because I put, I had a cross with Jesus on it and that's going to let demons in the church. And I'm like, how do demons come from Jesus on the cross? I thought that we got our victory from that, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but there's a problem with this. There's a third area called the Orthodox Church who never were Catholic, right? In the Orthodox Church, they have this, they have this uh, theology in the Orthodox Church, and we have a beautiful Greek Orthodox Church up on Yamato Road. Has anybody seen it? Beautiful. It has the gold dome. You've seen it, the beautiful gold dome, right? Have you seen it? It's beautiful. Have you ever looked inside? It's beautiful inside. Like, it's amazing. Marble floors, and, and if you look in there, they have like... Uh, uh, colors everywhere. They believe in colors and, and they have pictures of, of, of saints that went before them. And that would make some of us uneasy, uh, except here's what the Orthodox Church believes. The Orthodox Church believes that uh, we can experience God spiritually. And we would say, amen. amen. You can experience God physically, to which we would say, amen. and you can, you, can, you can hear God through worship and community. And they say, and we believe that you can represent God's glory visually. Amen. And so they have beautiful colors everywhere. They say God's glory is beautiful. Our church should be beautiful. And they have pictures of saints that went before them not to worship. They're like, we never did worship these people. It's just a testimony of what Jesus Christ has done through people. Amen. And so we have, yeah, come on, yeah, give it up. And so we have pictures of, of great people before us as a testimony to what God has done before us. And so when people are like, oh, you can't have these things that you worship, they're like, what are you talking about? We've never worshiped anything other than God. We've never prayed to anyone other than God, right? And so sometimes if you look at this picture right here, you might look through it through the filter of your background and not necessarily the truth. Does that make sense? And so if a picture makes you uneasy, uh, perhaps we need to check our filter, we need to maybe change our filter a little bit because, you know, they call him St. Stephen, but guess what? Uh, you're a saint as well if you're a believer in Christ. So it's not wrong to call him St. Stephen. It's just a little weird if you go up to people and say, hi, St. Sarah. But it would be correct. It wouldn't be incorrect because we are the saints of God. Does this make sense? And as we're about to read, the Bible says that even the unbelievers saw Stephen's face glowing like an angel. And they said, we want to represent that visually somehow. How do we do that? We put a glow on him because the anointing of God. It's a, it's a representation of the glory of God upon him. And so when you see that, and, and if it makes you a little uneasy, just say, maybe my filter needs to change. Because I promise you this, we're never going to pray to Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to offer the blood of a goat to Stephen we're not going to sacrifice chickens to Stephen. We're not going to set up an altar and put a little, you know, whiskey or, or rum or whatever voodoo maybe is from your background. That's never going to happen here. We're not going to put a big statue of him in a corner, right? And then bring offerings. It's not going to happen. It's a painting of a guy from the Bible. Can we, are we okay? Can we just drop a little religion? that we've learned. Just come on, drop a little religion and get free. Can we do that? So there you got Stephen. Bam. Now let's get in the word. Acts chapter six. All right. Come on. We got to get free. We can't allow like worry about what they are going to think, control what we are going to do. And if you don't get anything out of this message than that, hold on to that. And just meditate, write it down, take a picture of it, make it your, 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 your background or your phone, and just hold on. Like, don't let the worry of what they think control what you're going to do. Amen. All right, with that in mind, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 11, let's read the Bible. <clears throat> it says, then, now, and if you remember, Stephen was preaching the gospel. He was preaching, doing miracles, and it made some people some uneasy. 
<clears throat> then they secretly induced men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. And they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. For, man, I feel the anointing of God in here right now. This is very nice. Hallelujah. For, ha, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. For, mm. <clears throat> All right, let's give this another whirl. Let's, let's look at a run and start at verse 13 here. They put forward <clears throat> false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that mm, this, this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Amen. Hallelujah. How, let me tell you what's happening here in, the, in, this, in, this, in this court case. Like every other court case, what, what's happening here is there's a battle over what is the truth. What is the truth? And I have a bit of a sobering word today, but I don't have a condemning word. So I want you to be, feel free, all right? Amen. Are you good? There's a battle over the truth. In, in our country, there's a battle over the truth. In this earth, there's a battle over the truth. Who's going to define the truth and who's going to enforce it? That's, that's what's happening. A lot of people are worried about who's going to make sure everybody knows what the truth is. And, uh, and, 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 and before we move on, I want to remind you of something that we established last week. Put it up, please. My words are powerful. What I say matters. Amen. Let's say it together again. My words are powerful. What I say matters. I feel like there's somebody in the room who wanted to say it, but you didn't have the guts. So let's say it all together one more time. My words are powerful. What I say matters. Now, we did a whole teaching on that last week. So watch uh, last week's message or listen to the podcast online to get it because you were given power at your creation. When God created you, he gave you authority. And so your words matter. What you say matters matters. And the enemy knows this. <clears throat> he knows that your words are powerful. And that's why, hear me, he wants you to twist them. That's why you get that feeling that you can't be free to say the truth. That's why you get that feeling to kind of embellish a little bit, to just exaggerate a little bit, or to tamper down the truth a little bit. Because the enemy knows that your words are powerful and he doesn't want you speaking the truth. Can you hear what I'm saying? <clears throat> and what, 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 what Stephen was speaking to was, he was speaking to a religious system at the time, and it was a religious system that said, we're going to use our position with God, and we're going to get this position with God, and we're going to use it to increase our power and to protect our position from other people. So all of a sudden, it wasn't the truth that was important, but their position that was important. Do you hear what I'm saying? It wasn't, it wasn't what, what is God saying or what is the truth saying. It's what works best for our interests. And that's fine when you've surrendered your interests to Jesus. But when your flesh is still alive, has anybody got living flesh in this place? Yeah. Then all of a sudden, your interests can influence what you call truth. And when you agree with that lie, all of a sudden, your words are no longer the word of truth, but the words of the enemy. And it's so easy, and it's, it's so easy to slide into this. It's, it's, it's so easy to go from, I'm going to stand on God's word, I'm going to trust him, to slide into defining truth based on what works best for us. Right? It's so easy to slide into that. And uh, <clears throat> we see this, and in, 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 in I apologize to anybody in this room that this would offend. I don't want to offend anybody. But we see this mostly in politics today. In politics, it seems like it's okay to lie somehow. It seems like it's okay to not tell the full truth if it helps your side. And God forbid, if anything you say might help the other side, then you better lie. Yeah. Now, both parties, and we have two major parties in America today, both parties know that some of the legislation that the other party is putting forward is good, and they will lie against it because it hurts what they're interested in. And God never said, you have to tell the truth unless you're in politics. He didn't say that. Well, that's the way the game is played. 
well, you can play the game and go to hell if you want, but I, I'm, I'm not playing that game. That's playing with fire. Amen? The problem is when you say a couple of words, it's when, you start, when you start living in a way where, the, where a lie is not a big deal, where a lie is part of your business. Now, we see this a lot in sales, right? If you lie in sales, you will make more money by and large, right? That does not mean you have to lie to be in sales. You can have a sales background and make plenty of money. You can be an amazing salesman and help people meet their needs and make a good, honest living. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and those of you who are in sales, I hope you're not lying to people. I hope you're telling the truth. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that you're a good enough salesman that you can have to have a good job and not have to sell a bad product and use lies to do it, right? Amen. Right? Amen. Just be a person of integrity. It's, it's, it's important. And, and the world is actually looking for someone they can trust. Amen. The world is looking for people that they don't think is lying to them. Like, I would pay more. Like, like people go and buy cars from the companies that you can't negotiate with just so they're not lied to. Even though it's going to cost more than if you were a good negotiator somewhere else. Like, I would rather pay more to not be lied to. The world is desperate for truth. Our world is desperate for truth because people are lying all the time. And who's going to be the people speaking the truth? If it's not going to be the Christians, then who is it? Like, like, we're it. It's, a, it's a, the church of Jesus Christ is the only place that can start it. I mean, literally, we're, we're based on the truth. That's what we say. We follow the truth. We follow the man who is truth. That's supposed to be our job. I mean, that's us, right? That's what we signed up for, telling the truth, even when the crowd disagrees. I see a lot of Christians who are in politics, but I don't see a lot of politicians that are Christians. Because Christians are Christ's followers. And Christians admit when they're wrong. Christians repent when they're wrong. That's what Christians do. They say, I was wrong, forgive me. And Christians, according to Jesus, go to the people they disagree with and work things out. They don't go on TV and badmouth them. My Bible still calls that sin. I mean, it's still in the Bible. We can't say we hate people because they belong to a certain group of people. As a matter of fact, if we hate them, that means we got to love them. And when you love people, you don't go on TV and badmouth them or put Facebook posts about them, the whole group of them. That's not love. That's I'm not a Christian. We're not allowed to hate whole groups of people we don't know. I've never met these people, but I hate them. How's that working out for you? Is that bringing love and joy in your heart? Of course it isn't. Okay, I just... I get on that rant now and then. Forgive me. Now, listen, Jesus came to set things right. He came into a system way more toxic than we have today. And he spoke the truth. The words of Jesus are truth. They're truth. They may not be popular, but they are truth. And if you're a follower of Jesus, there's going to be parts of God's word that you are going to struggle with. Can we just be honest? That parts of his word you are going to struggle with. Either you're struggling with it or you're not listening. <laughs> That's all there is, right? Either you're struggling with things in this book or you're not really reading it. That's it. That's, that's what you're, oh, not me, brother. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, you said things like sell all you have and give to the poor. How's that working out for you? you? Got that one worked out yet? How about loving your neighbor as yourself? You got that one worked out? You mowing your neighbor's lawn, paying his bills. What are you doing? Huh? You're popping in on a Saturday saying, let me just do all your laundry for you because I did my laundry. How's that working out for you? Loving him as yourself. How about this one? Be perfect because I'm perfect. How'd you work that one out? Anybody in here perfect? If you think you are, then I got some news for you. You're really not. You got some serious issues that need to get worked out. You know, if we're honest, as Christians, we pick and choose what part of this word that we're going to follow. And then we find other people who agree to the same stuff, and we call it a tribe, right? 
That's my tribe. The people who believe this scripture is the important scripture, right? And, and, and the world is doing the same thing, like, you, I mean, there's a, oh, wow, Jesus, okay, got to bring that one back in. There are people making headlines today that could not have done it before the internet because there's like 20 of them in the whole country. And they start a group online and all of a sudden you think that there's really people who think the world is flat. Like, no, there really aren't, right? Like there might be a couple people who want press, who might say it, but by and large, there's one in a billion people think the earth is flat and none of them make any sense. Are you with me? Are we on the same page? And if you think the earth is flat, sweet Jesus, I, there's deliverance going to happen right here. <laughs> At the end of the service, <laughs> come on. Well, how come I can't see it? Well, because we can't see everything, right? I've never seen Spain. I just believe it's there, right? We pick and choose what we want to follow in the Bible, and like, this isn't good. This isn't what Jesus told us to do. Maybe, maybe, hear me, maybe Jesus set up a faith system that actually took faith. Maybe he set up a system that takes faith. Like, I don't know how to follow all these words. Maybe, maybe he wants us to be humble and not think we have it all worked out. Maybe that was like kind of baked into the cake. That you wouldn't know everything. You'd actually have to rely on Holy Spirit. Maybe he wanted to send us out into the world, not as perfect gods, but as people who are just carrying a redeeming process as we're continually being redeemed with our relationship with Jesus. And we just share our redeeming process with the world yeah. instead of going out like we're, we got it all figured out because I promise you, we don't have it all figured out. We barely got our little slice figured out, right? And then finally you get old enough that you realize half the stuff you're trying to figure out doesn't even matter. You're like, I don't even have time for that nonsense anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is anybody old enough to know what I'm talking about? The stuff I used to argue about, I could care less about right now. Like, I'm like, this has nothing to do with anything. <clears throat> but we can't, we can't judge the truth based on how it affects our agenda. Right? That's like, we, we can't. We can't allow it to define our, and, and, and this is hard uh, as Christians because we love to be right, um, but as Christians, we have to begin to admit our flaws. We have to begin to admit our flaws. <clears throat> I go around telling people about um, just the mental health. Like, I tell people about when I lost my mind. Um, my wife doesn't like me to say it that way. I did find it. Hallelujah. But it's the truth. And I came out of that season a more humble man. And I'm just thankful. And I'm just trying to hold on to it. Anybody been through a season of crazy? You know what I'm talking about. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody went through a season of crazy? You know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to like, I don't want to go there again. Keep the agenda, you know, clean here. You know, we have to admit our flaws. And the crowd wants you to lie. The crowd wants you to agree with the crowd. The crowd wants you to be like them. The crowd wants you to fall in with them. The crowd wants you to hate what it hates and love itself. That's what the crowd wants. The crowd wants to be so self-righteous to think that it knows everything. And, uh, but Jesus actually called us to go out and create a new normal. He sent us out to create a new normal, not to fit in with the crowd. It's like this, like, how do we fit in with a crowd that doesn't put Jesus as number one? How does that work? Right? <clears throat> and this really requires us to be humble. We have to be humble. We have to quit acting like we know everything. We have everything figured out. We have answers to everybody's problem. Like, people come to you, and they ask you the solution to stuff, and you can just be like, bro, I, I mean, I'm barely keeping it together myself. Man, I, I will pray because I've seen it work. I feel you right now. That sounds hard. Like, but you're supposed to be a Christian. No, no, no. I know someone who's got the answers, but I'm not him. I can tell you where he hangs out. I can bring you Sunday morning. You know, you can hopefully meet him. But like, like I, you know, 
Is this right? Can we just be humble enough to know we don't know everything? Because here's what happens if we don't. If we don't do this, if, if we, the Christians, aren't humble enough to, to let the world know we don't know everything, then we will create a form of Christianity that just looks like the exact religious system Jesus came to break. The self-righteous, I know everything. If it benefits me, then it's good. Agreeing with the politicians for more power. Corrupt, not concerned with truth, concerned with power. The church is supposed to be the opposite of that. The church is supposed to be the exact opposite. We talked about this last week. Paul wrote to, to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. This is what we're talking about. What is the household of God? The church of the living God. The pillar and support of truth. Now, Paul's a genius. Uh, his writings are amazing. And uh, in, in Ephesians, Paul portrays the church three ways. He, he talks about it uh, uh, a spiritual place. Uh, he talks about it socially, the ecclesia. And, and, and he talks about it um, architecturally. He talks about it as the house of God, the building uh, of God. And uh, what it's supposed to look like, show me the first graph here. So, like, like Paul's painting this picture that the church is like this building, right? And in and, and this building, uh, buildings protect people from the elements, right? That's the whole point of having a building to protect yourself from the elements. And so this roof, this protection, this covering that we're under is the truth. This truth that we come out of the world and gather under the truth. We're not affected by the crowd. We're not affected by the world. We're not affected by the enemy. But we actually are protected by the truth. And Paul says here that the, the church of the living God is the pillar in the support of the truth. The church is the ones that are the pillar in the support of the truth. And if we have lies in the church, then where's the world going to go? If we lie about we're perfect and, you know, we, we got to get perfect like us, or we lie like God has a certain political party, or we lie about, you know, things that we really have no business speaking on because we don't really know. Judging people and who's in heaven and who's in hell and who's a heretic and who's a God follower and who's not and how you're supposed to dress and how you're supposed to. We invent rules God never came up with. And if we're not, if we're not the ones for truth, who's the ones for truth? Is the world going to sustain the truth? I tell you, the church is losing the youngest generation because they understand the lies that the church is perpetuating. They're not fooled. They see it for what it is. And I hear so many conferences talk about how we're going to get after the young people. We've got to have programs. Got to... No, what we need to do is just start getting real with the world. Yeah. This, is what, this, is what the, this is what they're looking for. They're, I mean, there's a whole, there's not a generation. There's now two generations. The church is talking about, oh, we need to reach the millennials. Millennials having kids already. I mean, like, if you lost the millennials, there's a whole generation and a half after them you're not reaching. I go to conferences. And a lot, of, a lot of folks, even older than me, talking about, we got to reach the millennials. I'm like, then who's in your church? Do you got wheelchair parking out front? I mean, if you're not even reaching millennials, where are you, what, who are you reaching? Who are you preaching to? The same 20 people the last 40 years? Now, forgive me. That sounds so judgmental. And it's more, it's more judgmental than I meant it to me. Because you can have a church of seniors and Jesus can, can be in it. And Jesus can be about it. Amen? Amen. I mean, that, that, absolutely. And so that was slanderous. I didn't mean it that way. But what I mean is if you want to reach some people, if you feel like God has called your church to reach some people and you don't have anybody young in it, we got to look at what we're talking about. We got to look at what we're talking about. Our place of refuge has to be the truth. And this takes humility. And even when it looks like it would be better for us to lie for Jesus to help him. Well, how come you prayed for him? He had cancer and he died. Well, God needed another angel. That's a lie from hell. <laughs> what? You're telling me God killed their child and that's supposed to be helping our cause? That's helping? But you, we prayed. We all prayed and then he get healed. Why did they get healed? Man, I don't know. But I do know right now they're in heaven and they're not in pain. I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't. But I am praying for you. Can I bring a meal? Can I come and clean your house for you? Can I serve your family somehow? Amen?
The Spirit of truth will speak through you, but you have to be humble and you have to have a heart for Jesus. You have to have a heart for Jesus and His heart for His people. And so we want to reach a world, right? And so we wonder, why are we not reaching the world? I have a little, I have a little, I have a little exercise we're going to do, all right? You ready for this? Go ahead. Can you put up that, that Yahoo search thing here? And we're going to search for something together. You ready? Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Type in, <clears throat> why are, we were all caps here, but that's okay. Why are Christians, Christians so, and let's look at the answers. The top 10 fill in the blank. Why are Christians so stupid? Why are Christians so, this is, a top, this is a top search about Christians. Why are Christians so hateful? Why are Christians so mean? Why are Christians so nice? We got one. Why are Christians so, watch this, judgmental? Why are they so unhappy, intolerant, annoying, self-righteous, ignorant? Wonder why they're not coming to our church. Do me a favor. Pick a letter. Pick any letter. Shout a letter out. C. What? C? Give me C. C. Let's see what C says. Close-minded to science. Cruel. Crazy. Condescending. Confused. This is what we're up against. We want to reach the world. How do we reach the world? Not that way. Does this make sense? This is a, I have a radical, radical, radical belief in, um, don't, like, I'm going to go out on the edge here and just hear my heart in this. I have a radical belief that Jesus actually loves people. I just, it's just, I just have this, this, just have this deep down in my heart feeling that Jesus actually loves people, whether they're with him or not, that he actually is love. And I have this. This is what they call the orthopraxy. How we put that into practice is we are actually supposed to love them also. And that often doesn't include being mean or judgmental or ignorant of science. <laughs> when did that become a Christian thing, man? We used to be the most educated people on the planet. Now we believe that God buried dinosaurs to trick people. Like what? What? <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm like, have you met my friend with the flat earth? You know, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? How do we, how did this become us? Look, we got to do better than this. Amen. Yeah. We got, we got to do better. Listen, we have to be a community where it's okay to be flawed, have doubts and struggle. The church has to be a community. Where it's okay to be flawed, have doubts, and to struggle. We ha I mean, like, it's, we have to be people that are like, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. I met a God who's perfect. I'm around him. I get happy. What does that mean? I don't know. He's good. You should come just meet him, right? Are you with me? You know, the church wasn't actually built for Christians. It was actually supposed to be. It was Jesus' idea that we would gather together and reach the world, not judge the world. I feel like he already appointed a judge himself, right? Leave all the judgment to Jesus, all the reconciliation to us. That's how he set it up. But, you know, we want to be the crowd. We, we're desperate to be the in crowd. And so we set up our own little religious system with the judgments and the bitterness and the stone throwing and the heretics. And uh, I just saw a long post about Francis Chan was at a gathering with all these false teachers, and can we really trust Francis Chan? I'm like, what are, that's a pretty bold statement to call someone a false teacher. My God, negating their whole faith? Like, that's, wow, I'm, why are you not fearful to type that out? I don't get it. I don't get it. Like, wow, what, what level of prophetic, apostolic, bishop, pope do you have to be? Like, have you met Francis Chan? Wow, that's amazing through your supernatural spirit of discernment. Have you noticed the most discerning Christians don't believe in the gifts? And I wonder how they're discerning. How are you? If you don't believe in the gifts, how are you operating in the gift of discernment? That is so odd. You must be amazing. 
It's all about you, isn't it? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Help me get on track here, Chris. Help me. Help me, Chris. Help me. So let's listen. This is this is a dynamic, okay? This is the dynamic. There are there is the in group, and the in group protects the in group, right? And the in group ostracizes anybody they can, so there's no ostracism on the in group. Do you understand? That's how society works. We got to find the group that we are, the correct group that we're a part of, and then we pick on the person who's outside the in group. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you've not been to middle school yet, right? Like, because that is middle school defined. It's that middle school where you find out that there is a group that you are not a part of, and they've all decided that you got the cooties, right? <laughs> and if you're a dude, that could result in a beatdown. And if you're a girl, that can result in you to this day thinking that you're fat and ugly. Right? And they're all lies. Because groups are stupid. Crowds are dumb. You read the Bible, you're not going to see a lot of crowds that God is applauding. Crowds look for a scapegoat before accepting responsibility. Right? And so the Christians, we want to be a, we want to be a crowd too. Only problem is Jesus told us what kind of crowd we were going to be. Watch this, Matthew, or excuse me, yeah, Matthew chapter 10. He says, behold. He's like, listen. That's what, behold means like, listen, pay attention right now, right? Right, pay attention. He says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. How about that? How about that being the big crowd that points fingers and says, who's a heretic? And where the world is going. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. What's it mean to be innocent? When you talk about innocent, it's like people who don't see evil. We had a young woman in our, in our, in our church here who was, um, <clears throat> who was going to get married. And uh, she was going to have her bachelorette party. And uh, she loved Jesus, always lived for Jesus. And uh, she said, hey, we're going to this, this club. I'm like, what? Like, why would you possibly go to a club, like you've always lived, she goes, no, there won't be any guys there, it's ladies night. I was like, that's not how that works. That's, no, that's innocent. That's innocent. That's what innocent looks like. That's what he's talking about. Be innocent as doves. That's not the church that we're a part of, though, for some reason. We see way more evil than we see purity in the world. It's like all we see is evil. Ladies' night. Pretty funny, right? Have you ever noticed that ladies don't go to ladies' night? And gentlemen don't go to gentlemen's clubs? You won't see any ladies in ladies' night. You won't see any gentlemen in gentlemen's clubs. As we continue to read... <clears throat> Jesus is saying, listen, we're not the attackers. We're not the ones attacking the people in the world. Somebody already has that role. His name is Satan, right? And if you haven't, like, saw when they pick teams, we're not on his team. <laughs> like, when we're populating that Yahoo search result by making people hate us, that's working on his team. We're supposed to be on Jesus' team who said, come, all ye, who <laughs> heavy laden, right? And I will give you rest. That, that's the team that we're on. We're the team of, hey, hey, just come and, and take my yoke upon you. That's, that's the team we're on, right? That's go and tell them whoever, you say their sins are forgiven, their sins will be forgiven. My God, find a Christian today forgiving people the world their sin. Find one. On. It's hard to find. They're, they're busy calling out. Come on, that's, find one. Listen, your sins are forgiven. That's what he told us to tell people. Okay, I'm going on a rant now. All right, I'm, I'm bringing that, bring it home, bring it home. Are we okay? Yeah. Are we having a good time? Yeah. I'm just trying to speak the truth here. Watch this. He said in, in verse 17, he says that men are going to hand you over to the courts and, 
and, and, and they're going to beat you in the synagogues and, 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 and even you'll be brought before kings for my sake and as a testimony to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, look at this, do not worry about what or how you are to say, for it would be given to you in that hour what you are to say. This is literally what's happening to Stephen. This literally, we saw it happen to the apostles earlier, Peter and, uh, and, and John, or Peter and James. Uh, earlier, I'm just going to act like I remembered, Peter and his homie, uh, uh, earlier in Acts uh, chapter 4, uh, and, uh, and uh, now we see it happening to Stephen. Jesus said it was going to happen. You want to hold on to a promise, there's a promise for you right there. Promise of Jesus. You're going to walk with Jesus and people aren't going to like it. But he says, hey, in that moment, you're going to be a testimony to the non-believers because I will speak through you. Now, in order for that to happen, you have to actually have a heart for people the way Jesus has a heart for people. Not to judge them, but to love them. And if you'll have the heart of Jesus for people, then the Spirit will actually speak through you. Verse 20, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. That's what we want to bring. That's what we want to carry to the world, the Spirit of the Father. Right? Remember Stephen was speaking with such wisdom, they said they, they weren't able to cope with the words, with the prophecy that was coming out of his mouth. Remember that? Now, I'm, I'm believing, I am believing so strongly that God is raising up a whole new generation of prophets in this house. Just, just a, a strong prophetic anointing, just a strong prophetic anointing, calling things that aren't as if they were, speaking things into people's lives. I'm talking about changing the spirit of people. You know, and if you're humble and you're honest, Holy Spirit will speak through you. Right? Now, Holy Spirit may speak through you otherwise, but if you're not humble or honest, it gets all messy. It gets dirty. If you ever got a prophecy that felt like a shackle instead of freedom, that's what happened. Somebody's flesh and their soul was all over it. How they saw it was all over it. You know, the word might have been good, but it came through a flawed vessel and you got to pick out too many bones. Uh, this uh, Easter, my wife talked about, we're, gonna, we're, we're sending these, um, these postcards out. Uh, there's thousands of them. We're mailing locally here to our whole mailing list. And... Uh, we just, we just want people to come and experience, like, we, like where are people going to experience this? We just want them to experience life. Like, Jesus wants us to have people experience life. Forgiveness, freedom, love. Like, it shouldn't be that complicated. And, and you know, we got these little, these little invitation cards. You just get to invite somebody. Hey, come to church. You see that? You see that like there? Hey, come to church. And all of a sudden, I'm not part of the crowd. I'm actually on Jesus' team. Hey, come to church. Oh, I should go to your church. Why don't you just come? <laughs> oh, come on. You got a reason. In that moment, Holy Spirit will speak through you. Amen? Shabba. Pray in tongues. Go up to him. Shabba. Check this out back to I'm going to try that too. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to go for it. Shaba. Acts chapter 6. It says, 611. Go back to our scripture here. It says, Then they secretly induced men to say, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Let me, let me explain this to you. <clears throat> On the Day of Atonement, once a year, uh, when the sins of Israel were atoned for, what would happen is there'd be a sacrifice, and the priests would go beyond the veil three times. They'd do something the first time, come out, do some other stuff, go back the second time, come out, do some other stuff. And on the third time behind the veil, he would speak as part of a prayer the name of the Lord. Now, that was the only person who was allowed to say his name, and that was the only time it was allowed to be spoken. The highest priest spoke it once a year, the third time beyond the veil, beyond the Holy of Holies, on the Day of Atonement, right? That was the only time. Now, the way the name of the Lord, they considered it so holy, they only wrote what's called the four letters, Y-H-V-H. Though some people, it's in Hebrew, it's not English, so it's not really Y-H-V-H, it's what we would call Y-H-V-H. And some people believe the first letter is not a Y, it's better as a J. That's why some people say it's, you know, when they put in, it's only four consonants, excuse me. And so when you put in the vowels, some people say it's, Yahweh. Some people say it's Jehovah, 
right? It's the same four letters. That's why, like, Jehovah Witnesses will say, hey, do you know the name of God? You'll be like, yeah, it's God. And you're like, no. If, wouldn't you like to know somebody, somebody to call you by your name? We know his real name. His name is Jehovah. You should come learn in our cult, right? Don't fall for that, okay? <laughs> just, I, just, that's like, I just want to help you out here. That's, and if, if they have a big billboard of stuff and pamphlets, just walk on by, all right? Just keep walking. I like to stand and have conversations with them when they're in Deerfield Beach and I'm riding my bike, but that's neither here nor there. You know, gosh, I probably shouldn't tell you this. this Do you know that the Spirit of Christ on you, if you, talk to, if you talk to bound people long enough, they will start to manifest. And it'll come out as anger or whatever. And at that point, you know, they have an opportunity to get free. I encourage you to check that out sometime. It could be a lot of fun. All right. So, but here, here's what I want to show you. Okay, so, it, so, uh, so now if anybody spoke the name, like, so the name of the Lord was spoken once a year by the high priest behind the, temp, behind the veil at, on the third time. Uh, and, you know, after uh, the temple was destroyed, they couldn't do it anymore. And so it has not been spoken in so long. People don't actually know how it was supposed to be pronounced. We just have to guess. That's where the Yahweh, Jehovah, we don't know. Because only the high priest could speak it once a year behind the veil. It's the only time it could be spoken. How they learned the name, I don't know. But that's the only time it could be spoken. And in the penalty, according to the Mishnah, which is how the rabbis interpret the law, the penalty for that is called blasphemy. If you speak the name of the Lord outside of that time in that place, it's called blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy is death. Okay, so I want to show you what religion does, right? Here's what the council says. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against. When did Moses become God? When did Moses become God? Moses represented the laws that they decided which laws were the important ones. Really, they had made themselves God. And what they were saying was you spoke against the crowd. And we don't let people speak against the crowd. This is what religion does. If you're not careful, your little set of beliefs that we all just decided that these are the important ones, and and if Jesus ever sends somebody to rock the boat, we kill them. This is what happened. Now, come if you would. Now, it's important to get this. Religion said you could never speak the name. And Paul, in his genius, as I said before, all throughout the book of Romans, he's... He's, 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 he's juggling this law and this grace. And this is the radical part about Christianity. Jesus Christ is going to speak to you really, really hard words, really, really strong truth. And he's going to talk to you about his radical grace. It's radical, just unbelievable, scandalous almost grace. Like, I can get into heaven after doing What? scandalous and at the same point he speaks these radical hard truths hard truth and they're both true most Christians only fall on one side or the other but we as a people we have to do better we have to say man God loves unconditionally and anybody who comes to him he receives with his arms wide open loves you so much so much sent his son to die on a cross and at the same time loves you too much to leave you that way this is the truth and it's crazy it's hard to understand that's why we need holy spirit and in the midst of this paul trying to teach the jews in rome that the law is not gonna it's not gonna cut it it's not gonna work it won't save them he goes through this genius diatribe and he gets to Romans 8 15 and he says for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we can cry out Abba you can say his name yeah oh Jesus you can call him daddy you don't have to fear ever again calling out to your God The veil has been rent. You don't have to wait for the priest on the third time to go beyond to say the name that nobody knows. I'll give you a name to call him. His name is Father. 
and he loves you because you've been adopted by this God. Listen, Christian, we got to stop trying to act perfect. We got to stop trying to fit into the crowd. We have to stand with Jesus. We can't be ashamed of the scars in his hands and the scars in his feet and the crown of thorns. We can't be embarrassed that our God is, was murdered by someone else, that someone else got power over him because he chose it to happen that way. And we can't be embarrassed to bear our own scars. We can't be embarrassed to bear our own crown of thorns. We can't be embarrassed for people to see the holes in our feet and the holes in our hands and the limp from our hip that's been touched from struggling with the angel of the Lord. Amen? The world needs something better. And it's going to start with us being humble. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can say your name. We thank you. You've given us authority. You've given us the right to be adopted sons and daughters of God. That you've welcomed us in. You call us sons and daughters and give us a new name and a new future. And you give us your identity and you give us your love. Ministry team, you can come forward. And I just, I want to pray. I want to pray that you would know the love of the Father. That you would know that He gave up His Son for you. That you would know that it's only by Jesus becoming humble that we could ever come into relationship. Shakaba. Some of us, we carry wounds of childhood. We carry wounds of adolescence. We carry wounds of life and we're scared to let them out. And I'm here to let you know today the love of the Father is here to touch your heart. The love of the Father is here to mend it. The love of the Father is here to draw you home. The love of the Father is here to heal all that hurts. Shaka. Father, I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that your love would come. That we would experience this spirit of adoption where we're no longer cast off, where we no longer have to worry about the acceptance of the crowd. We no longer have to worry about fitting in because you, there's place in your house for us. You have made a place for us. Jesus, you said, I go to make a place for you. And we stand today firm knowing, Father God, that you have a place for us in your love. You have a place for us in your heart. We don't have to look for the systems of this world to fit in because you call us your child. And I pray right now, I pray right now for those under the sound of my voice right now. I pray for those who have, have a hardened heart that it's been hard for you to receive the love of God. It's been hard for you to receive the love of your brothers and your sisters. It's been hard for you to receive the love of a pastor. It's hard to receive the love of a spiritual mother and father. It's hard to receive the love because you're expecting something else to happen. I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the love of God, the unconditional love of God would come right now and flood your heart. That the love of God would right now peel away the scale, would peel away the scar tissue, would begin to bring healing in the name of Jesus. I just see hearts that were abused. I see people who were lied to and betrayed. And I see the Father. I see the Father weeping over those wounds. And I see Jesus carrying those wounds on the cross. And I see Him bearing stripes so that you can be healed this morning. That you can love in a way you've never loved before. That you can trust in a way that you've never trusted before. That you can open your heart in a way that you've never opened it before. That you literally would be able to function with the heart of Jesus. That you would literally be able to use the love of Jesus to love the world. So Father, come right now. Come bring healing. Come bring healing. Draw your children home. Draw your children home and let them know that they're loved. Father, I pray. All those under the sound of my voice. Shakaba. 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 I feel this so strong. Inger, would you come forward for me, please? I feel like, I'm so sorry, I'm going to drag this out for one more minute, but I just feel like some of you, you've never had the love, you've never had the hug of a mother who loved you unconditionally. 
And I just feel like there's an anointing on anger this morning. If you've never had the loving hug of a mother, an unconditional love, you think of a mom and you think of judgment. I just, she's going to be here. And if you've never, why don't, you just, why don't you just do both here? Come on, Ralph, right over here. And if you've never had a father affirm you and show you love, I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning. And God's going to do something supernatural in somebody's life. I didn't plan this. It's just going to happen. But if you need prayer for anything in your life today, I don't want you to leave here without knowing that we care about you. We care about what's going on in your life. We care about your health. We care about your friendships. We care about your finances. We have a ministry team up here who would love to pray for you. And so let me bless you. Father, I bless your people right now. I bless them to walk in your love, to walk in your power, and share the truth of Jesus Christ with the world. And all God's people said, amen. Can you give a clap off from the Lord this morning?